Um, as Chittaranjan said, I'm with the Illinois State Water Survey, which is a unique uh, entity in the country. Um, I'm going to need to, can I have the, uh, sorry. Um, we're at the University of Illinois. We're part of a department on campus. Uh, it's uh, called the Prairie Research Institute. Um, a lot of fancy names. The water survey has been in existence for a long time, however, um, helping the well owners and, uh, and stakeholders that deal with water in Illinois. And so um, I guess I'll just get started. Um, so today I want to mention a little bit about the water survey and what our role is in the state. And um, you know, we operate kind of as a sister agency to a state geological survey, if you will, um, but we deal strictly with water. And then I want to talk about some of the issues important to well owners. And the private well class, um, it's a new online um, free class that anyone can take. You sign up if you have an email address and uh, talk about the success we've had with that and uh, what's available through that and then a little bit about some other programs that are out there. Um, so um, the water survey um, started with the chemistry department at the U of I in the 1890s. We have our own chemistry uh, group that has a private lab or that has a, a lab for private well owners. Until 2006, we offered free water sampling to any private well owner in Illinois for inorganics and metals. Uh, through that process and through those activities, we have a database of 30 to 40,000 um, water quality samples. And so that's really helped the work we do. Um, as I said, we're a sister agency to the Illinois State Geological Survey and Illinois Natural History Survey. Um, the way we work, we're really there to solve problems for the state of Illinois, but we also expand and do things more on a national scale or that are na neighboring states or some issues that are more regional in scope. And um, when we came to the U of I, which um, until 2006, we were part of the Department of Natural Resources in Illinois, and then we moved uh, to this department at the U of I. And so we have a groundwater section, a surface water section, atmospheric chemistry, uh, in atmospheric sciences and uh, chemistry groups, and the state climatologists and state hydrologists. You know, there's a state geologist at the State Geological Survey. All those designations are all at, uh, at the scientific surveys. And so our group is, is small, 14 staff, uh, made up mostly of engineers and geologists. And uh, a lot of the work we do is uh, related to pump tests or aquifer assessment or water quality assessment of the aquifers in Illinois. So we collect data, we do research, and we have public service. And the public service part uh, folds in with everything else. Those of us that do a lot of research um, also are involved in public service, and that's how I got involved. I've done a lot of work with well owners. Um, the unique part of the water survey, honestly, is that I'm able to do research, and I've been funded to do research my entire career, um, and I don't have a PhD. I have a master's degree, which, um, you know, is a big advantage, obviously, uh, to be able to um, get funding and do those sorts of things, and it's all practical. Um, not a lot of theoretical research on some treatment technology that may see the light of day in 20 years, but more how to solve a problem that's going on today that either community or it's with an aquifer or uh, helping define what new state regs should be, those sorts of things. So it's very practical, and it's very hands-on, and, um, and those sorts of things, have, uh, it's, it's been a fun place to work. That's the bottom line. So we also house the well records for the state of Illinois. Now, I found out this morning at DHHS that um, private well owners have been required to file logs with the state of Nebraska since 1993. That's actually very late in the game. Um, most states, it's been in the 80s or earlier. In Illinois, it was 1963, and that's why we have so many well logs um, on file. We also have an observation well network, or several in the state, where we monitor water levels and water quality. Um, we put out a monthly report that goes on statewide on some of those issues. Water use reporting, um, we have a program called IWIP, the Illinois Water Inventory Program, which until 2010 was voluntary, but it was made mandatory by law, uh, amendments to the Water Use Act in Illinois. And uh, I'll mention a little more about that, because now it's going to require irrigation reporting in Illinois, which is a, a new thing. And we do things like aquifer testing, and I put GW Info in here. We've developed a pretty comprehensive database that's accessible and ties in um, all these different things, whether a well's been used for an aquifer test or water level measurement, or it's been uh, tested for water quality. Um, it's all accessible to us uh, through an application that we've developed. Um, public service, that's uh, really where the private well stuff comes in. You know, a well owner in Illinois buys a property and says, I just bought this house in Champaign County. What can I expect? What do I need to do if I drill a well? 
we can look at our well records and give them some advice, um, how deep they need to drill, if they're gonna have any water quality concerns, those sorts of issues. Um, we do a lot of public outreach. The picture on the bottom here is a project we had where we worked with a bunch of FFA chapters um, after the flooding in 93, um, so it's a little dated, but um, I was involved with that. Um, being an FFA alum, um, it's kind of near and dear working in small communities, and so we went to five school districts and ended up getting samples from um, over 800 private wells for nitrate and coliform bacteria um, after the flooding that was in 1993 in Illinois. So, and again, our well records. Um, we also do a lot of research, especially contaminant studies. Um, we've done a lot of work looking at, um, you know, the pesticide issues and non-point source pollution. Um, some of the things that are also a big issue here in Nebraska. Um, well interference, small community versus uh, large community when they develop their water supply. Um, you know, Chicago is the big gorilla in Illinois. We have 26 million people in Illinois versus your 1.8. Uh, 13 million are in the six counties that are closest to Chicago. And so it's really, for most of us that live downstate, there's Chicago and then there's Illinois. But um, that's a, a biased opinion, I guess. So um, I want to mention quickly, uh, just because I'm involved with a number of things. I know, talking to Bruce this morning, Bruce Dvork, Dr. Dvork, um, many of uh, the folks working here at Nebraska wear a number of hats. Um, and that's very true for what we do. Um, I'm fortunate, I think, to be able to be involved in a number of different projects. Um, including this private well class that I'm going to mention in a minute. We also developed a website for small community water and wastewater operators called smallwatersupply.org. It provides information free to small community operators, and the idea being that there's a lot of good information out there if you know where to find it. Small community operators are these guys who are working part-time or have a full-time job somewhere else, and they're trying to run this small system of 600 people. They don't have the time to go find those things. They end up paying money for things they shouldn't have to. And so we've developed a website and a community, basically, um, for those operators to use to find the resources, or they can call us and we'll find it for them. Um, EMOR is uh, monthly electronic reporting that all operators have to do in uh, every state. But in Illinois, our system isn't electronic yet. We're kind of behind the curve. And so we're currently developing an electronic system for them to report their monthly operating uh, water use uh, um, and the water chemistry data for uh, municipal supplies. Um, as I mentioned, the Water Use Act's changed in Illinois. Starting in 2015, irrigators have to um, give us their annual pumpage. The law has very little teeth. Um, it doesn't require meters, and so we're working now to develop methods for them to use to estimate their pumpage, and our goal really is to have a better handle on how much irrigation there actually is in Illinois first, and then work them along. Um, the ag lobby in Illinois is very strong, as it is probably in Nebraska. And so most water law that involves anything that would um, affect agriculture has always been um, shot down, basically. And so this law um, now requires them to report to us. And so we're trying to work with Farm Bureau and some of the irrigation associations in Illinois. And you know we think we have a big issue um, compared to Nebraska. You know I found out last night you have nine million acres um, of irrigated land. Um, we have about seven hundred thousand. And so our scale is a little different than what you have here. But we have enough rainfall in the state of Illinois that except in the sandy areas and a few areas where they're growing specialty crops, we don't need irrigation. So we're fortunate in that respect. Um, the other things here, this the last one is kind of related, the CDC project. Um, one of the things that we've learned by doing this private well class is that there are a lot of barriers to private well owners even wanting to test their well. It's like going to the dentist. Um, people avoid going to the dentist, why? You know, um, eventually you regret it if you don't do it, and or even going to the doctor if you need a checkup or those sorts of things. Well, it's the same with your well. A lot of private well owners just believe it's safe. They're not um, interested in finding out, or they just don't want to know because they just assume nothing bad's going to happen. And so CDC's funded us to survey all the organizations and groups that actually do outreach to well owners to find out what things have worked for them. You know, we did an online class. It, far exceed our expectations as far as the number of people that signed up, but it's still a drop in the bucket compared to how many well owners are out there. Um, you know, what's successful and why? Do you need to scare people? You know, certain things work in certain areas, and we're looking at all those issues. Okay, so some issues with private wells. I'm just going to give you some examples. Here's three things. Um, we did an inventory of the wells in an area where a large uh, community was planning to put a regional water supply. Um, there's naturally occurring arsenic, and I understand that's the case in, in, in uh, Nebraska as well. 
Um, we have certain aquifers that have high arsenic, and so we've done some look at what the natural variability is there. And then um, there's a new problem in urban areas, especially because of road salt. And so I'm just going to point out how those are related to private wells. Um, so the first one is this road salt issue. This is a Lake Michigan allocation from, 20, uh, from 2000. So Chicago pulls water out of Lake Michigan. Uh, 3,600 CFS is what they're capped at pushing uh, or pulling out of the lake. Um, and they supply it to all these communities. These are the six collar counties, and you can see um, the municipal boundaries are there. And the county, uh, the, the furthest west, the lower one there that only has communities on the east side is Kane County. I'm going to show a, a diagram here. So what's happened is even though Cook County, which is what Chicago is in, is completely urbanized. There are over 3,000 private wells in use in some of the small unincorporated areas there. And uh, this really became a problem. Um, one large manufacturer had a big spill. No one jumped on it and no one realized it was going on because um, everybody's on Lake Michigan allocation, so no one's using groundwater. All of a sudden there's a huge cancer cluster from private well owners in the area and all of a sudden there's lawsuits and um, it was, I think it was, um, I don't remember what the chemical was now, but it was about 15 years ago and it really raised awareness to understanding um, private wells are everywhere, um, right in, you know, between municipal boundaries or out in the middle of nowhere. And so um, the issue here, Kane County, which I mentioned um, is one of the western counties, this is the uh, chloride values in their municipal wells over the last uh, 40 years or so through 2000. And this is a little dated, the work that was done um, up through 2000. Um, chloride isn't a problem per se, but um, it gets high enough and it tastes like salt. Um, we have areas where there's salt water, naturally occurring salt water from bedrock, upwelling into freshwater aquifers in downstate Illinois, and those aquifers are no longer drinkable because of it. And here we have the shallow groundwater that a lot of private wells are on um, is becoming salty. And eventually um, they'll need to add treatment or at least treat for taste in order to use that uh, water. So we're contaminating all the shallow water in the Chicago region because of road salt. And uh, it's really led to some changes and we, it's happened in other states as well. Um, this is a rural subdivision. Uh, the scale here on the whole picture is about 2,000 feet. Um, we were looking at arsenic in a uh, confined sand and gravel aquifer in Illinois where we see a lot of variability. Um, a well, a quarter, two wells a quarter mile apart, one will have an arsenic value of 200 ppb, the other one will have a value of less than three, and the standard's 10 for municipal water supplies. So we started looking at this variability, and what it led to in the end was we, um, we have a unique situation where this is controlled uh, by bacteria um, and how reducing the conditions are near the well. Um, when the conditions aren't quite as reducing, then the, back, the arsenic stays bound uh, in the mineralogy, and when it gets more reducing, it gets released and it becomes part of the problem. And it happens at the local scale of the well. We have places where these wells were less than, you know, um, 100 yards apart, and they're almost an order of magnitude different. And so how do you regulate that or how do you even address that issue or tell people what they're going to have. And one of the interesting things here about well owners, one of these homes, they were trying to sell their home. And in Illinois, there's a law that says if you know anything about your well or your water quality that might affect the sale, you have to put it on a piece of paper. So the well owner told us, you want to sample our well, you do it when I'm not home and you don't send me the results. So there's a moral dilemma. What do you do? Do you sample it or do you not sample it? I'm not going to tell you what I did. So, um, but it's, it's that sort of thing. He didn't want to know because he didn't want to have to put it down on his um, realtor's uh, form uh, what the situation was. Um, and lastly, this is a, the, a large sand and gravel aquifer in Illinois um, that on the western side, just west of this map, is all sand and gravel at the surface. And that's where 40% of our irrigation is in Illinois in two counties, uh, 2,300 center pivots. But the whole aquifer extends back, it's a buried bedrock valley, and extends back um, through 11 counties over probably uh, over 100 miles. And um, we were asked to look at um, what would happen if a regional water supply went into this. We've done some groundwater modeling so we know the kind of drawdowns we're going to see, but we don't know about all the private wells out there. How many are going to be affected? 
are they is the water levels going to are the uh, are the water levels going to drop enough that their pumps are just going to go dry and we can lower pumps or is the entire well going to go dry what's the situation so we were funded um, I was funded to um, go out and inventory wells in nine of these townships and it's kind of the middle area here where the aquifer is the thickest and what we found um, in 12 MGD well field we found 1708 wells and 788 of those we didn't have on file which to us is a big deal now um, if we didn't have well records that didn't start until 93 we probably would have had 20 percent of the wells on file um, but we consider our records fairly complete from all the work that's been done in different areas and, and some of the research we've done and so, you know, not finding less than 30% is kind of typical, um, but it just goes to show the magnitude of the problem if this community went ahead and put a well field in and they assumed they were going to have to fix 50 wells and it being 100 wells, that's quite an expense, uh, you know, as, as far as um, not understanding and not knowing um, what's going on. And the thing about this project was we went to these individual homes and talk to every well owner. How deep's your well? Um, where's your pump set? You know, what other information can you tell us? And can we take a water level measurement? Um, we, the ones that let us take a water level measurement, because a lot of these folks are rural and they don't want this community to come out and put a well field in in the first place. Um, most don't know their pump setting. I have no idea. If they, the well's fairly new, we can get that from the driller or the contractor. Um, and most don't know the depth, or they give us a depth, and then we find a log and it's off by 100 feet and these are 200 to 400, 300 foot wells and so well owners aren't informed about their own situation where the water's coming from and, and that's kind of the point here so it matters because um, for one well owners come from every situation you know near Champaign we have professors who um, lived in New York City they now they're a professor at the U of I they bought a house out in the country it's beautiful it's quaint they get to winter and all of a sudden they don't have any water. They realize they've got an old board well and they have no idea why it's frozen, why they don't have water. They have no idea how to maintain the system. No one's given them any clue. They didn't even realize, and this actually happened, they didn't even realize they had a private well. I don't know how you could buy a house and have that happen, but that's what he told me. So, um, and then on the other side, you have folks who, you know, fourth generation, lived in the same house. That well's always been there. My great grandfather dug it and it's always been fine. Well, um, since great-grandfather dug that well, there's been a lot of changes, both in the number of wells nearby, um, the water quality and how chemicals are used, and even in um, how well that well is, um, how capable that well is of producing water. Um, things fail eventually. Finding a well, we find wells over 100 years old that are still in use, but they're rare. Um, most wells don't last that long things happen, they get, if it's a screen, they get encrusted, all those sorts of things. Um, but well owners don't really understand, um, more than not, the issues related to their private wells that they should. And if it's underground, it's safe. Just like in a small community, um, the folks that live there don't understand why you'd have to dig up a main and replace line that's leaking. Um, they've never had to do that before. They've never even seen pipe under the road before. It's been 40 years since anything that's been dug up. Well, it's old transite pipe that's got asbestos in it. It's starting to deteriorate. They've got to take it out. It's hugely expensive. It's a small system. What do they do? Well, it's always been underground. It's always been fine. Water comes out my tap. I don't have to worry about it. And uh, that's the problem. So um, there was a really great study done by um, folks from Extension in, in Minnesota and uh, University of Wisconsin and also um, MSU um, and here's some of the results, and I can give anyone this reference who wants it. Actually, it's in our private well class reference notes. Um, but they sent questionnaires out to almost 2,700 people in a number of counties in each, uh, I think two counties in each state. And they tried a bunch of different things looking at attitudes. Um, what I want to show you is, do I have a point on here? Well, the, the figure on uh, the top 10 reasons, uh, that is the top 10 reasons why the folks who responded that they'd never had their well tested, why they said they've not tested their well. Um, we've been drinking it for years, 53%, and they could, they could answer multiple uh, responses out of these 10. The one that bothers me the most is number 10. I don't want to know. 8% of people who hadn't tested their well don't want to know what their water quality is. Um, you know, some of these people have kids or grandkids that come over and drink their water, or maybe they don't drink their water, that's why they don't want to know. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of variability there, but it comes back to the same thing. It's, it's the attitude that well owners have and just assume things are fine because it's groundwater and groundwater is safe. And uh, we know it's, that's not the case, especially you know that here in Nebraska. Um, and it's about being aware. So what we try to inform people of and what we try to get at, um, the message we get across is that you need to understand your well, your log, what aquifer your well's coming from, what's the history of that. You can find water quality information if you're willing to look for it. Um, you know, you need to know if there's, there are situations. Is there natural occurring arsenic, for instance? Well, the health department in Tazewell County where the arsenic work we did was, they've made a huge effort since we did that study to inform all the residents that you need to test for arsenic and it's really made a difference. But it's a health concern and as soon as there's an alarm that goes off, then a lot more people are willing to test. But it's about being um, informed regardless. And uh, so that's what we try to get across that you need to understand your well. Not only does it protect your health and your kids' health, but it also um, maintaining your well the right way and, and sampling every year will identify problems that may save you thousands of dollars if you have to replace parts of your well and those sorts of things. And so um, what we focused on in our class, which I'll mention in a minute, is working with local resources. So we developed this class. It's nationwide. We can't obviously understand every situation in every state. We're in Illinois. But it, um, when I get a question like, well, what does somebody in Illinois know about New York's groundwater? Then I bring up that we've given you an overview of what every well owner needs to know and be responsible about. It's up to you then to look at local resources to try to find out what your specific situation is. Or they call us or email us, then we'll find that person for them to get back to them. Um, personal experience. I wanted to mention, I grew up on an old dug well, 18 feet deep, four foot diameter. This isn't my well. Um, we had a little well house. But it was in the middle of a ravine, and it was in the middle of a cow pasture. And uh, when I was in college, um, I'd already started working at the water survey. I came home one weekend, and my dad took me to the side and says, I don't want mom to know this, but I need your help. We've got frogs in our well. And so, um, and, and one of them was dead, and there's two, and one was still alive. He'd taken a 20-foot chimney rod and put a barb on the end of it and was trying to gig them out of our, our, our dug well. So um, I'd already been at the survey several years and used a drill rig, and I, we, I went and got a contractor's pump. I drove back to Champaign, got a contractor's pump. We pumped our well dry. We disinfected the whole thing with a pressure washer, and uh, um, my mom found out, obviously. But um, that's the kind of thing my dad was willing just to pull those frogs out of there and be done with it, not thinking about the contamination we'd already caused and all those sorts of issues. So, um, you know, when I, my folks sold our farm, uh, when I was just got out of college, and um, they had to chlorinate it two or three times to get it to pass a test for the bank to give the folks a loan that wanted to buy our property. And, you know, looking back on that now, they really needed to drill a different well. Uh, that well, they were able to chlorinate it and take care of the bacteria issue, but obviously there's a pathway there um, for bacteria or frogs to get in our well, so um, something needed to be done. Um, I wanted to mention this morning we met with uh, the Department of uh, Health and Human Services uh, to talk about some of the things they're doing and it was really interesting. Things I probably should have known about and didn't related to grout and some of the issues that they've been working with UNL on. And so I just wanted to mention um, some of the challenges that I've learned about since I've been here, especially the issue of um, all the nitrate issues related to well construction. So there are 98,000 irrigation wells. Most of them have been there for quite a while. And until I think it was 88, I believe, I might have my dates wrong, um, drillers were able to just fill in the annulus with gravel. So it's got a gravel pack for um, an annulus, which should be the part of the well that protects the well from the surface. And instead, it's a conduit for um, things to leak down through. And that's what, there's a video on their webpage um, which I pulled this from, and it basically shows the old well construction, the new well construction, and how it doesn't matter if those wells that have gravel pack are still out there, they're a conduit for nitrate or anything else from near the surface to get in to the aquifer, um, even below the clay layer that's supposed to protect the confined aquifer that's being used in parts of the state. So um, they're coming up with a plan to rehabilitate a lot of these wells um, and it sounds really promising to me it seemed like it would be really expensive but they've come up with some innovative ways 
And there's just issues like this grout study that was done here with UNL that, I, like I said, I should have known about it and I didn't. But those of you who are interested in aquifer and water quality and private well issues should watch this and look at that information. Um, because what it tells us is that a lot of the regulations requiring liquid grout, you know, 20% solids grout in our wells um, was an uninformed approach to sealing wells. And they've determined that you need to use bentonite chips, which, um, you know, a lot of it's more expensive. Um, it's not as easy, and depending on the type of rig you have. Um, but there's changes that need to be made, and there are issues um, nationwide, especially here in Nebraska, though, um, because of all the wells that you have uh, that need to be addressed. Okay, so um, I should have put a timer on. I'm not sure I'm at on time. What time is it? Thank you. Um, I want to talk about the private well class. So this is, um, we were funded through the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, which is a technical assistance organization that has offices in, I believe, every state. Um, they have six regional offices. They had funding from US EPA to look at both wastewater issues and do technical assistance and training. And because Congress um, decided they should also to do some work with private well owners. And so they came to us and um, because of our experience with private well owners, we developed um, this approach to um, basically provide online training for anybody that wanted it about their well. And it's meant to be, as I said earlier, kind of an overview of all the responsibilities you have, but also why. Why it's important to understand your well, why it's important to sample annually, um, you know, what kind of things can come up. Even if you've done everything right, you need to be aware. You need to know your well log and what it means. You know, what's it mean uh, the size of casing you have or whether you have a screen or not if you're in bedrock versus uh, sand and gravel. You need to be aware, if you're the steward of your water system. You're no different than a community water supply, except you're only supplying a few people. And so you need to take that seriously and you need to protect, not only to protect your family's health, but also to protect the resource. Um, like with these wells that have gravel pack all the way down, that's a conduit for contaminants to get into the aquifer. And once the aquifer is contaminated, you know, it, it costs, Let's say it costs twenty thousand dollars to rehabilitate a well to keep it from leaking materials down into an aquifer. That's nothing compared to what it will take to remediate an aquifer that's contaminated or that can't be used anymore. So, a number of folks, including communities, will have to go to a different source that might not even be available. And so, it's important to protect the resource to start with, not try to clean it up. It's a much less effective and more cost uh, costly way to go. So, we developed this class. Um, the goal was to give them direct targeted information and again why it's important, why they need to understand it, and uh, so that they understand the threats and what they need to provide. And you know, I come from an ag background. I grew up on a hog farm. Um, I'm not uh, taking the approach that all wells are bad. Matter of fact, to me when I hear that well owners are using bottled water so they don't have to worry about it, that's a shame because most groundwater is safe and it's fine. Um, and it's very good water, and really that's what folks should be using if they can, and that's kind of where I come from. So our game plan was um, not to reinvent the wheel or to do everything from scratch, so I used uh, literally hundreds of resources that are available. Co-op Extension is very active in a lot of states with um, well owners and providing information on best practices and those sorts of things. A lot of the state health departments or the state regulatory agencies that regulate either drillers or well construction and so we spent a lot of time pulling that data together and coming up with here's the topics we want to cover, A to Z, um, starting with here's how water flows into a well to here's what you need to do about treatment. And then we found resources that were publicly available uh, and that's how we developed this class. And again, to get people engaged. Um, one thing I will say, um, I had someone tell me, well, you know, you can't reach out to well owners. A lot of them don't, won't do anything. Well, that's true. And this is a lot of work to go through this class. Each lesson takes an hour to hour and a half, and there's 10 of them. But we're trying to hit people who really want to deal with their well situation. And we're, so we try to get them engaged. And if they follow through, they're, those that did finish this are much more informed, and they've been very positive about um, how beneficial the class has been for them. Um, again, providing a 
a complete picture of the issue and why, and we marketed this through stakeholders. We work with Co-op Extension, state health departments, all those groups I mentioned a minute ago. They put information on their website. Um, so we also provided a way for them to contact us, and we've literally answered hundreds of questions. Sometimes we send them to a state agency or to a local health department uh, where it's a local question that needs to be answered by that professional. Some are general that we can answer, and we've done that. And so, um, but we've tried to be very consistent in our approach and highlight the fact that everyone needs to use local resources and that there are a lot of local resources available if you just know where to look. Um, and that's where we've tried to send people. So here are the 10 lessons, you know, the, the science of groundwater, groundwater flow, the hydrologic cycle, porosity, all the basic parameters that deal with water flow in the ground, um, how water gets into your well, the different types of wells, and again, some people complained, well, I have a bedrock well, so why do I care about a well screen? Well, you know, we had to cover everybody. And so it's good information to have anyway, uh, to understand that there are differences, and you don't have a screen, you have an open borehole if you have a bedrock well. All those things matter, and you need to understand where your water comes from. Um, O&M practices, uh, and then what to do in emergencies. You know, even forest fires affect wells. Uh, wires get melted, short out pumps, um, you know, a lot of things can affect a well in a rural area. And then we had an entire lesson just on finding local help because we wanted to stress to people that's what you need to do. You need to go to your county health department or your state agency that has that data that can provide you your log or those sorts of things. And again, all the way through to um, source water protection and sampling and water treatment solutions. And this tenth one, you could write a book just on water treatment, obviously. There is no way for us to deal with that. So what we've tried to provide is materials that would inform you on um, what to be aware of and what to look for. The main types of treatment, um, the fact that you know it's a business and a lot of people try to sell you equipment that may be not useful. We provided a resource. There was a great paper out of Penn State about what to be aware of from a salesman who sells water treatment equipment. And then some of the standards that are there, UNL and um, um, you know, some of the certification for equipment so that you know it actually works. And it's worth paying a little extra for equipment that's been certified and some of those sorts of things. Um, this is the first lesson that starts out, there's a pretest, And I'll show you a couple, uh, at least one example of some of the questions in the pretest. Uh, because this was an EPA grant, we have to show outcomes and progress. So we have a pretest and a post-test. Uh, to show that folks actually learned something by taking the class. And those that went through the entire thing and took the test, obviously uh, um, it worked out in our favor. So the science of groundwater, here's, here's an example of porosity. This came from a, an, uh, a paper in New York. Uh, this is from Iowa, from their DNR um, on groundwater basics, and it shows both sand and gravel and bedrock aquifers. And there's a lot more text to go along with this to help explain the terms. And so it's really just a basic uh, information. And then issues like source water protection and uh, abandoned wells. I don't know about in Nebraska, but in Illinois, there are probably two abandoned wells for every well that's in use in the state. And we only know about less than half of the wells that are actually in use. So there's hundreds of thousands of abandoned wells, especially old dug wells from when Illinois was settled. Um, all the time this happens. Uh, something falls in a well, somebody gets killed. Um, those of you that are older, who remembers Jessica, Jessica McClure? A little girl that was in Texas in a well for 18 hours, and it was on CNN, live coverage the entire time. Um, you know, those things, they do happen. And three of these are uh, articles are from Illinois um, when this was put together back in the, uh, in the 90s. And so it, it does happen. And so just to be aware of, you buy a, a farm, you decide to buy a farm, uh, just a farmstead, you have a well that's in use, I guarantee you there's one or two other wells there in most cases that are not in use and may have a board over them or maybe they've, you know, and that's got dust and dirt on it and now the board, you can't see any of it. There, are, You need to find out those things and understand the property you're on. It could affect your kids, it could affect your livestock, or any of those things or anything else in the future and it's a conduit for contaminating an aquifer, potentially. So uh, that's, um, this is out of Penn State. I know there's one, I think Wyoming might have two through extension. It's called a drinking water interpretation tool. Um, I pointed out because it's one of the things we provided in the class is a link to this. You 
get your water tested, you have trouble understanding the results. It happens a lot. People don't understand milligrams per liter versus micrograms per liter versus you know parts per million and parts per billion. And so Penn State, through their extension, um, worked with uh, a couple other extensions that put one of these together. And you type in your values, and it will give you this is over the MCL, this isn't, here's where you can go for some resources. Now for Pennsylvanians, this is great because it links to resources in Pennsylvania. But for everybody else, at least it tells you where you stand on some of the uh, constituents in your well. You know, some constituent may say 0.4, and you think, oh, that's not very much. Well, the standard's 0.01, versus another that may, you may have 2,000 and the standard's 5,000. You need to know those details in order to really understand your water quality sample and so this is one way to at least get at that. And what we tell people is use this, take a look at it, make sure you use the right units, and then call your county health department and give them, get a second opinion from them. Because really it is, it's going back to local resources and someone and, and having a professional help you um, understand your results. Um, for each lesson, and this really just shows lesson one, there are a number of resources that I used to develop the lesson. And this links to all those. They're all publicly available, they're all online, and that was on purpose. So not only can you, um, you know, I wrote all the lessons, for, good, for better or worse, that's what happened in the end. And so if you don't like my style or it's not clear to you, you can go back to any of these resources and find specific information on some of these topics. And we've got a ton of comments about having these additional resources really help uh, them understand uh, you know, another perspective, another point of view. And so we've provided all those online as well, and so you can see um, uh, that sort of data. And here's a couple examples. You know, who knew in Michigan they have 28 million gallons a day being lost to flowing wells? You know, some of us would love to have that problem in some states, right? Um, I put the Minnesota Well Owner Handbook because the state of Minnesota, their Department of Health, is one of the best in the country. They provide very comprehensive resources. They've got great staff. Every time I send somebody to them, they, you know, they have three guys working on it. And uh, I don't know how they have all those resources, um, but they really do a good job. And so, and their, their well owner handbook is very comprehensive. Um, I've used, this is one of the resources I used from Nebraska. I threw it in here because I was coming here today. Um, it's in that resource list as well. Um, this has a template about how to dis determine the condition of your well. And it's very useful. And so um, I recommend you take a look at it. Um, so for the questions, again, the idea behind the pretest was to help well owners get engaged into this, to what we were doing. And so when you ask, when you, this is question 15, the health standard for arsenic for community water supplies, I don't think I mentioned that before, there are no standards for private wells. There's no regulation for private wells except maybe in one or two counties in the country where counties decide to be proactive. There are no regulations for private wells, they're all for community water supplies. But we use things like 10 PPB which is the community standard that uh, every community water supply has to meet um, as examples of what's safe and not safe, and we use it very uh, ubiquitously. So here, here's an example, um, again, getting at the fact that most well owners and a lot of people have trouble with the math related to parts per million, parts per billion, that sort of thing. Um, your water sample had 0 .001 milligrams per liter of arsenic. What's this equivalent to? Well, the correct answer is one PPB. Only 39% of the people who asked, answered the question got it right. Um, and so that, you know, it's great that that was the highest of the four, but obviously a lot of people don't understand how to convert those units, and that's a concern. And so what we tell people in that respect is that's why you need to take the class. It's also why you need to talk to your local health department or um, local professional. And again, things like anthropogenic contaminants, what does that mean? Um, you know, only 47% knew that that's a result of human activities. It's a big, big word, um, but it gets to the point. A lot of the literature and a lot of the materials out there talk about natural occurring arsenic versus anthropogenic, whatever, and uh, it's something you need to understand. Um, we tried to get as many partners involved as we could so that folks would put things on their websites, that sort of thing. One of the unique features, we, we did webinars along with this, and we asked anyone who was interested to host a webinar for well owners who may not have the internet access or don't have fast enough internet access to actually uh, put a webinar on their laptop or on their computer at home. And this was really successful for us, for us in Illinois because we work closely with our extension uh, group. And so for all the webinars we did, we had a number of county um, extension offices 
where they had a, a workshop where you could come in and have a seat, watch the webinar, and then you could sit and talk about your well. And what we found from that is the best part of that is everyone's around their peers in the end. And so if someone brings up a problem and they're like, oh yeah, I've got that same problem. And people can talk about their issues and, and be more informed. Um, obviously, not as many people did the evaluation as took the pretest, which is fine. We had about 260 or so take the, uh, the, the, the evaluation at the end. Um, it's been very successful. As I said, we only had three people say they wouldn't recommend the class. Um, and we asked people what they were. were you, are you a well owner or are you something else? You know, a health professional. Um, what's interesting is um, nearly 20% were health uh, professionals, sanitarians at county health departments. And I've probably got 30 emails from sanitarians saying, can we get CEUs for this? Or um, this is by far is more comprehensive than any of the training I've had, and I inspect wells every day. And so we feel good about what we provided. And I think if anyone who goes through all the material will certainly have a better uh, feel for the private well. Um, and here's some of the other folks, what they responded. Um, you know, some who are just looking at putting their well in, for instance. Um, different types of program staff. And so, you know, a lot of people have taken it. And so where we stand today, um, we've had 2,650 people take the class so far, and this started January 6th last year. So um, in a year. And what we told EPA is we hope to get 1,000 people to take the class in our year that we had. And so looking at that metric, we've obviously been pretty successful. Um, and then the next thing I usually say is, um, but you need to realize there are 12 million private wells in use in the United States, and we've reached 2,650. So um, what that gets to is all the work like that Extension does and the health departments do, and in some, of the, in some states, Department of Natural Resources, everyone who's working with private well owners, even Farm Bureau in some cases are working directly with private well owners on, on private well issues, there's more work to go around than we can ever fill a need. Uh, we, can, we could never fill the need is the bottom line. And so um, there's, it's a critical issue in a lot of areas uh, just because of um, things like more wells that go in, abandoned wells uh, in Nebraska here where you have issues with your well construction code allowing basically contaminants. In Iowa, they have drainage wells for their fields. Um, that's basically a well put in the ground to drain a farm field in the spring um, that goes directly into an aquifer. And that was a practice because it helped drain the field without understanding um, the contamination that might be causing to the groundwater resources. Um, we've had, uh, as you can see there, our pre-test average was 64%, post-test 82, so we feel like we're doing a decent job. Um, some of the questions were meant to trip people up because I was worried when I wrote all the questions that too many people would get all the answers right. Well, that didn't happen, so um, that was a good thing, too. Um, quickly, um, a few other programs out there. Co-op Extension in every state has resources available for rural private well owners. In a few states where the state has actually made it a focus, um, they've developed, like in Virginia, this VA uh, Master Well Owner Network. There are four states that have Master Well Owner Networks. Um, how many of you heard of the, the National, uh, or the Master gardener or the, I think that's the right program master gardener network so that extension puts together well in four states they have a master well owner network where as a well owner you can go and take this training it's two days and you become a master well owner so that you can help folks in your area um, with basic issues related to your well or at least find answers for them and so um, NGWA is obviously really big. Uh, that's kind of the drillers organization, but they also have groups for scientists and engineers, which I'm a member of, and uh, they've got some funding from EPA and are doing um, efforts to um, get the word out. They have a website called wellowner.org that answers basic questions for well owners. It's very popular as far as it's one of the first things you find in Google um, and on looking at well owner information. Um, CDC, I just want to mention they have a huge push um, I was talking at lunch today with a couple faculty, and they actually are looking at the health risk related to private wells and seem to have taken the approach that all private wells are bad or they're at risk. And they started a program called the Unregulated Drinking Water Initiative because private wells are unregulated. Well, the groundwater and private well industry kind of had a fit that that was the name they used, and they've changed it now to the Private Well Initiative, PWI, and I'm on their work group. Um, 
but the whole point is um, they are unregulated and there needs to be more awareness made of some of the issues that might be affecting private wells. And they're funding tons of projects. I showed you that drinking water tool, uh, the interpretation tool. They're funding New Hampshire right now to develop a program that will be online that you put in what your problem is and it'll tell you what kind of treatment you need. And you know, as long as it's managed by like the state of Rhode Island and their health department, it's gonna be fair and objective. And uh, it's something that I'm looking forward to that being done because there's so much misinformation about treatment out there and what you need and don't need um, that having something developed that way will be really helpful. Um, US EPA is in uh, the private well business uh, being kicking and screaming. Um, they don't, they're not really interested in um, dealing with private wells because it'll you know, make their workload tenfold. But Congress has mandated that they provide funding for some private well uh, type of work and so they are. And <clears throat> there are efforts to require sampling of private wells. Um, one state, New Jersey, has had a rule on their books for the last probably at least 15 years that requires a sample be collected at any sale of property transfer that has a well. So every time you sell a house with a well, it has to be sampled. And not only does it have to be sampled, but it has to be sampled by the state. One of their people comes out and takes the sample. It costs $600 and the buyer and the seller have to agree on who's gonna pay for it. So as a well owner or as someone who's buying a property, that might be a little frustrating. But as a researcher who uses water quality data to assess aquifer characteristics and where uh, problems areas might be or if there's some sort of anthropogenic problem that's occurred in the last 10 years or you know a spill even, having 13, they have 13,000 samples a year that way. So now they've got, you know, upwards of 180,000 samples in their database all over the state of New Jersey that tell them exactly what their water quality is and all the aquifers they have. You know, what a wealth of information. If every state had that, we could deal with a lot of water quality issues head on. And so in that respect, it's a, it's a good thing. Okay, so that's what I have. And um, I guess I'll take any questions if there's time. Yes. Um, Illinois has a law of reasonable use, and there are no laws on the books that really require that, except um, in four counties. Um, a community in the 80s went out and put a bunch of wells in. It interfered with a lot of private wells. They denied it, caused all these problems. So they amended um, the Water Use Act in Illinois back then that in four counties only, if there's an interference problem, it has to be investigated. And that's as far as it goes. So a report can be generated. And uh, so there was no funding for that unfunded mandate. And on that, a lot's been done with it. But um, in 2012, when we had the drought, one of those counties is heavily irrigated. And uh, some of our guys did go up and investigate that. Um, and it turned out that these are wells that are naturally flowing and most of these private wells, they don't own a pump, they've never had a pump, and now their water level is a few feet below the top of the, the well, and they were gonna have to install a pump, and so nothing happened. Um, I had another case where a well owner called us because he um, was near a gravel pit, and the pit expanded towards his home, and every time they drained their large pit, his well went dry. And so um, he really had, what I told him, is to go talk to the quarry, see if they'll drill your well deeper. There was room for it to be deeper. Because if not, he was gonna have to hire a consultant to prove they were causing his drawdown, and then he could take them to court. That's the extent of our law. That's very unfair to a private well owner without the resources to deal with something like a, a quarry or a large corporation or company. So, Excuse me, I've been told I had to repeat the question. And the, ah. question the question was, do you have any problems with well interference between a domestic wells or domestic and irrigation wells? Yeah, very, very few. Um, and, yeah. We did, you know, back in 88, um, when we had the severe drought, um, we had an area where uh, it's a dolomite aquifer and the irrigators in mass uh, because of irrigation by August were affecting a number of private wells. But a lot of these wells were installed improperly and um, some of them were even in, under concrete in a garage where we couldn't get access to them. And um, it was unfortunate. 
Um, and the irrigators in the area voluntarily agreed to shut off their pumps from Friday 9, or 6 p.m. to Monday morning 6 a.m. And what we saw was, you know, as soon as that well goes off, that cone of depression pops up, and, and it allowed some of those folks to have water over the weekend um, until the irrigation season was over. Um, but, you know, it's a time-sensitive thing, and by the time you get people involved to deal with it, irrigation season was over, the water levels started recovering, and all the problems went away. So not really is the bottom line. Um, and I can imagine in this state that could be a big issue. So, yes? To go back to the contaminants for a minute, and especially things like, quote, naturally occurring arsenic, um, what can you do other than trying to mitigate what's already happened to the water to prevent the contamination? And specifically with arsenic, I don't know the chemistry of it, but um, you indicated the pH, of course, of the water um, releases the, uh, the, the arsenic can be released uh, in a reducing environment. And could it be that the reducing environment is caused by nitrates leaching down or some other um, human cause for well, the arsenic to be released? Talking to folks here the last day and a half, um, I understand that there are actually some issues with nitrate possibly causing uh, uranium issues. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm not a chemist. And honestly, uh, just like for our class, when someone asks me a water quality or treatment question, um, I have other folks at the water survey that I go to that are PhD geochemists and deal with treatment. And you know, that's how I would answer your question, to be honest. You know, I'm, um, I'm sure that's, I mean, that's what's going on. But in our case with the arsenic, uh, where it's the reducing conditions, there's other aquifers in the state where that's not the case. It's a kind of a unique situation. And um, we know that that also occurs in some places in Bangladesh, the same type of reducing conditions causing this release. But um, other areas like up in Wisconsin, they have areas where they've actually legislated certain units where you can't uh, finish a well. You have to, you have to either uh, case it off and go above or below it or whatever because the arsenic's so high, we're talking two or 3,000, where in Illinois, most of ours is in the uh, upper end of 250, 300 in, a, in worst case. So I can't answer your question. I'm sorry. More questions? Any other questions? All right. Thanks for your time. <laughs>